And joining us now, someone that knows Coach Kendrea very well. She was the star pitcher for Coach Kendrea in Arizona. And as it turns out, led him to his final championship series in 2010. All-American Kenzie Fowler, of course, Pac-12 Network analyst, now back joining us here to talk about Coach Kendrea. This has been a, a unique week now. It's been a week since the official announcement. Uh, what are your thoughts now that a week has passed? Are you Is it shock? Is it kind of no, – like, what has this week been like over there in Arizona? Um, I think at this point, all of my emotions have turned into happiness for him. I'm just really thrilled for him and Tina, his wife. Um, you know, that man has given so much to the sport. And um, Tina was joking with me after uh, the press – conference she was like you know we know people all over the world right and I was like of course she's like well we're gonna go see them all so I'm just really thrilled for him you know he deserves a, a long vacation if you will when when you found out what it the press conference or the statement came out like because I know a lot of people were speculating it was a topic in Oklahoma City and you you know but when did you see it finally in writing what went through your mind I was I was in the press conference. I was in the room um, at that last presser when they lost. I was tucked away in the corner helping with the social content. And my tears were just constantly just going down my face. I couldn't stop, even though I knew it was happening. And I, I mean, I would be honest with you. Um, a lot of us knew a little bit earlier, you know, it was just it was one of those things where, it, you know, if you're in the circle, you knew. And, um, but still, it doesn't matter. It was very emotional. And, um, seeing him, you know, walk off the field for the final time, I was checking social media and everyone was, you know, collectively kind of in on that moment and just really taking it in watching, you know, this legend leave Oklahoma city as a coach for the final time. Um, if you poke me too much right now, I'll start crying again because <laughs> that man, um, has done so much for our sport, uh, so much for our community here in Tucson, especially, a a Tucson girl. I grew up going to his camps. He was the reason that I wanted to play college softball in the first place. So just, I know his legacy extends so much further than just us alums. It extends across any player. I think if you're maybe 25 or older, you grew up on his VHS tapes, you grew up on his hitting tapes and that's how we all learned to hit. So just uh, a lot of emotions for sure this week. And we saw that at the press conference, although he, a typical coach, he was uh, putting on a show there. It looked like more of a comedy show than a retirement show. I mean, he was cracking one-liners. He mentioned you even in, in there at some point. You were in that room with a lot of the former players. What was that like to be in the room during that presser where a lot of the alums that could make it on short notice uh, were in the room? You're in the room. He's in there, but he's, you know, at the McHale Center and it's a packed house. Everybody's street watching it. But yet he's, yeah, he's playing some good line. He's giving one liners here. He's giving Caitlin Lowe a hard time about saying that, you know, she was not that good of a director of ops and things yeah. like that. <laughs> no, it was really special to see the generations that were there. There were players from the 80s, 90s, you know, my generation and then the current team. So it was just really cool to see all of all of the faces that were there. And I know some of the alums wished they could have been there, but quick turnaround. And there's a good amount of us that are um, here in town in Tucson and also in the Phoenix area. So uh, there's a good amount that made the drive down to see coach, but it was really special to, to sit there with all of the generations of Arizona softball players and just how far his reach has been through all of us. And um, whether you played for him in 1990 or whether you played for him in 2019, you know, you still have the same, respect and emotion and wanted to be there for him because of what he's done for us. What struck me is his loyalty to all the players. He talks about he, one of the things he looks forward to is texting. He likes texting now because when he used to give a phone call, it would take forever to have a, you know, with a conversation, but with texting, I wish all his players a happy birthday. And he tried, and, and we had, you know, talking to Christy Fox, uh, she said that he goes to almost every wedding as, as, as much as he can. Uh, what does that what, what does that say about him that he takes the time to try to stay in touch with almost every player? Which, as you know, college coaching is so busy. It could be easy to just say, "Hey, I'm I'm busy. I just don't have the time to catch up with everybody." But he makes that effort not only to keep in touch and wish you a happy birthday, and, and he says that's his way of staying in touch, but 
if one of his former players is getting married, he's going to try to go. So many, you know, and what, what does that say about him? I mean, it says everything. I know um, I, I had a teammate that didn't even finish out her career because she had a, a good, um, she got into a business school and things lined up for her. So she didn't even finish her senior year, but she's, she's still on that birthday list. She still gets those texts from him and um, he doesn't miss. He'll be the first one on your phone at 7 a.m. wishing you happy birthday and um, it was so special for him and Tina to, they came to my wedding in, um, 2018 and for him to be there. And I know he was in my, I think he was my dad's, um, my dad's toast. So that was really special. My dad gave him a big time shout out at, at our wedding and talked about my recruitment and stuff. And, <laughs> but that's how intertwined he is. And, um, he can cut a rug. I'll tell you that he likes to get his, his groove on the dance floor with Tina and has a lot of fun with us. Um, but it's so special for him to create those bonds. And I will say, I've said this before, but I, I feel like my relationship with him has gotten stronger since um, I graduated. Just, you know, being able to have a different relationship and talk a little bit more about life and um, joke a little bit more than you, than you can usually when you're, you know, playing for him and you have the ball and things are getting serious. So it's very special that he continues uh, that relationship, especially once you graduate. Yeah, I, I would imagine that uh, for sure. Why now? Uh, why did he want you on? He mentioned the fact of some of the reasons, you know, perhaps why it was time. And he thought about, honestly, that it would have been 2020 if it wasn't for COVID and things like that. But, and, and I know that this senior class was special to him. So I don't know if that played a role into it as far as when to go out. But why go out now? Because he's still sharp, still has the passion for the game, clearly. Why now for him? I think family, you know, I, I think he has grandkids. Um, his wife, Tina, um, her son is about to have a, have a kid. And so I think family, there's a lot that, I mean, he talked about this in his press conference, but there was a lot that he missed out on, you know, when his kids were growing up and, you know, he's taking care of all of us. Um, and, you know, he's been away from home for 40 years at this point. So I think family wants to travel. Um, he, he has good health, so he's able to do those things. I think, you know, you want to enjoy as much as you can. Right. Um, but I also think that, I think this could have been the cha the case also for Lou Harris Champer, like COVID was tough on all of us, but I think it was tough on the coaches realizing two things. Number one, how hard it is to come back and have to do it all again, like having to reset and and get back in there and, and start, it's hard. It's a total grind. Um, and then I also think he, he had some downtime where he realized like, Hey, I'm going to be okay. You know, we were away from softball almost the whole fall and the whole summer, nobody was practicing, you know? So I, I think he had a realization like, yeah, like I'm going to be okay. I'm I, without softball. My life will be pretty good. What do you think he does say come next February? Is he going to be at Hildebrand going to games? What What does he yeah, do now? 100%. Oh, he'll be at Hildebrand for sure. Okay. <laughs> I mean, he, he built that suite for him. I, I am convinced. He, there's a suite at Hildebrand that's up oh. on the first base side. And I'm convinced when he was in the design that he wanted to make sure that suite was there for when he retired. So he'll be there for sure. Has he thought about maybe going to media? He's not going to take your job, is he? I, I joked about this the other day because he's so good. We all know what, yeah. how good he is on the mic. I'm like, He'll be amazing, but I'll be out of work. So that's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. But, um, he can he can come do a, a guest. You know, we'll have him in for a couple of guests. Oh, that... what, whatever he wants to do, he'll be amazing. I, I know that he has a lot of ideas for the sport and he's very passionate about. Yes. I think we all kind of heard bits and pieces, you know, as, as the year was going on in his interviews about his thoughts on things. And um, I think I think he's going to take that to heart because I think People will listen to him, especially now that he has time to really think things out and, and make calls and talk to people and understand where decisions are, are coming from when they're being made. And um, I think it's really important for, for him to have that voice and to use it because you only have so many legends in your sport. And so the fact that, you know, you have one that is willing to speak up, I think will be huge for our sport. Well, and he's such a big time voice. I mean, yes. what he says, people care what he has to think. Yes. Uh, and I've enjoyed, and I got to give credit to uh, Danny Martinez, who will set it up all year. This year, a lot of the you know media availabilities were on Zoom, uh, so I got to cover a lot, a good number of them. 
and I got a chance to ask him questions. And one of them I did was right before the Super Region on. I asked about instant replay because that was obviously a, you know, a hot topic. It continues to be a hot topic. You know him. He's a big baseball fan as well. He sucks. And I asked about instant replay. And he said, there's two things that needs to be addressed. Instant replay, he said, and there's no great reason why we shouldn't have it. And he brought up the umpires and, and, and kind of the pull, needing to grow the pull of the umpire. And I never thought about it until he thought about it. He's like, there's... It's the same umpiring crew. It's wear and tear. We need some fresh, you know, new faces and kind of help grow that. That's why we're kind of where I never thought of that until he brought it up. And I think that's what we need to moving forward is ideas like that. I mean, I had him on the podcast a few many years ago and he talked about we probably should get rid of the illegal pitches. It's not good. Like we oh, it, it's overblown. He is not shy. He will say things that other people will are thinking, but won't necessarily say it. Right. So imagine him, you know, now unemployed, if you will. So so he has a lot of really good ideas, a lot of really good ideas. And you're, you're kind of, I guess, not restricted, but you can only say so much, you know, as a head coach and you only have time to think about so much. So I'm really excited for him. Um, Whatever his next venture is going to be. um, I know he'll still be in our sport for sure. Describe the first time you met him. When, when did you, when you met him? Oh gosh. I met coach when I was six, five or six, maybe. How? Yeah. So you've literally um, known him most, almost your entire life then. My, really? so you want to, want to dive deep here. My mom babysat his kids, Michael and Michelle, when she was in high school. Um, my grandpa, Norm Patton, uh, was his office mate back in central Arizona junior college. So when Coach Candrea was the softball coach, um, my grandpa was the men's basketball coach, and they shared the office. And here's the other kicker. The third member of that office club was the baseball coach at Central Arizona, and his name was Clint Myers. So, <laughs> so my mom was literally helping babysit. Um, I'm pretty sure she bought her first car from him, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I was growing up, you know, just knowing coach as coach Candrea, not really being a softball player until I'm about 10 years old when I'm really starting to get into it. And my grandpa is telling coach Candrea, like, Hey, you got to recruit my grandkid. She's really good. You should see her pitch a softball. And he's going, okay, Norm, she's 10. Okay. Well, <laughs> sure, sure enough, I end up being recruited when I was a freshman in high school. Wow. How would he, how would he recruit you? I mean, he's known you'll like, but does he, what, what's, give me, give me an idea. What's it like to be recruited by Mike Candrea? I feel like I kind of recruited myself because I just kept going on unofficial visits until he, <laughs> until it worked out. But right. um, no, I took a couple of unofficials to different Pac-12 schools and I was on my second, um, my recruiting story here, my, my second unofficial um, I wasn't really scheduled to go on. I had some friends coming in from uh, the plate for the firecrackers in California and we've grown up playing against each other. So they're in town. I'm, Oh, let me come hang out with you guys and walk around campus. I was 20 minutes, you know, from the, from the campus. And so um, both of them get, you know, verbal at the time they're a year older than me and um, they come out of his office and, and they're crying and they commit and, um, one of the girl's moms goes, Kenzie, you need to go in there too. And I was like, oh no, it's not my visit. You know, I'm just here. She goes, no, you need to go in there. And I was like, oh, okay. So I go in and 20 minutes later, I come out crying and my parents look at me and like, what's wrong? I'm like, well, I just committed. They're like, you did what? And I was like, I have to, I have to play for him. I just, I can't, I can't go anywhere else. And um, had to call some other Pac-12 schools and tell them, sorry, it was locked up. (laughs) So describe playing for him during that run and obviously a lot of success you got to that championship series against ucla describe playing for him during that time period because as we'll get into here he's changed since then i feel like Uh, we'll get into but i first want to know how was it playing for him during that time period well people always ask me what it is what is it about him and i think it's just his consistency and i had a very up and down career there were a lot of real highs and then there were a lot of real lows especially later in my career and um, was trying to find my feet, my feeding and um, had some injuries and couldn't really get back to where I, I was a couple of years prior. And I remember him sitting me down and saying, hey, we don't need you to be, you know, who you used to be. We need you to be who you are now and whatever you can give us is good enough. And so 
Um, we had a really long conversation about, you know, transitioning my role from a full-time starter to being a, a spot reliever and coming in the last six, seven innings and try and close things out. And um, I was just so grateful for him to stay consistent, even though things were, were like this for me going up and down. And um, I'll never forget my, my senior year. I spoke at my, my graduation and he was there with my parents and my grandparents and um, just he always made sure he let us know that we were more than what we were, you know, on the field, you know? So the fact that he comes to weddings, the, the fact that he came to my graduation speech just shows you, he values you so much more than just a softball player. When you decided to get into broadcasting and you told him, unless he found out before you told him, I don't know, but what was his reaction when you told him you were getting, you're going to be broadcasting and eventually cover him among a uh, part of the PAC 12. I was always the player that had my phone out on the bus trips and I was like <laughs> editing that had my camera. And I was always just that, that girl that had um, was taking pictures for the team. And so I don't think he was surprised. And um, he allowed me to kind of follow him around my first year out of uh, graduation and interview him. And even though he's like, what are you interviewing me for? You just played for me. And I'm like, come on, coach, I got to practice. Like, you gotta let me practice. Let me, let me follow you around here. And, um, film some things. And so he was, of course, so great, uh, gracious and let me just do whatever I wanted and roamed around Hill and Brand and hung out for fall ball and hung out for spring ball and did the, did the live stream for the team and, um, never once like questioned and was just like, yeah, go for it. Of course, do what you need to do. And, uh, yeah, seven years later. <laughs> did he always understand? I've always been intrigued by him. Because that was during the time period where they started doing those mid-game interviews with coaches. And when I, I remember when that first started, I, they would go to him. I always felt like he was not, I mean, like, it, like, why are we doing this again? Like, yeah. he was, right? Like, I it didn't feel like he liked doing it. Uh, he got more comfortable, I felt like, as the years went on with that. But it was that accurate that he was kind of like, and then you were probably thrown in there from time to time where you're, you're trying to ask him a question on the air and you're, you're probably yeah. thinking to yourself, Oh, good. What's he going to, how is he going to answer my question? You know? Yeah. And th those, <laughs> yes. The, at the beginning, he was kind of um, not joking with me on air, but you could tell his tone was a little bit different. <laughs> yes. And then, um, <laughs> and then later, of course, he got really, he got really used to it with, you know, Pac-12 network and doing all those games and stuff. So but you're right. It was a it was a transition for all of us, for sure. Oh my! Is there any like uh, funny stories about that? Like, with or even like uh, you know, in general during this time? Because you said you that your relation, you know, your relationship with him changed after you played. You got to know him better. I mean, part of that is because you're broadcasting, but part of it is you're around the program. So take me through that. How it? Why was it different once you were done playing? Was it just? The, you just weren't in, what describe that feeling compared to when you played for him. Um, you see a side of him that you don't see as much as a player, just more laid, more laid back. And it's, it's basically who you saw in that press conference. A, he's a total jokester. A lot of people don't know that about right. him. Um, he can crack a funny, he can, he can laugh with the best of them. And so I'm, I'm excited to see that that side of him thrive in retirement, just because, you know, you can't do that as a head coach, you got to be business. And he's always about that consistent business, but no, he's a, he's a total jokester off the field. Is he like that? Like in TV production meetings when he does those? Is no, he like, no, no, he, he, no. Okay. I mean, we'll do our, we'll do our zooms, you know, and, and yeah. prep and he's, yeah, he's, he's game on businesses game he's on so he's okay yeah. that's why i was because some coaches like to let loose some don't so i was always very curious you know, when he talks about his players you know with when he's got his arizona hat on he's yeah. he's yeah. coach kendra the businessman uh he seems to have enjoyed the last few years and, and he's admitted he took things for granted in the past that he didn't now because you know, he hadn't been back to the Women's College World Series since you led him there in 2010. He got back in 2019, and he's learned to – do you get a sense of that, that he really – this last, I don't know, three years, whatever, he's kind of enjoyed it more and taken time to appreciate all of this, where maybe he didn't do that when you played for him? I think so, and I hope so. You know, I think, um, you know, in, in his – deep in his gut, he knew, you know, this was it for him, so um, – I got really emotional on their senior day. I was watching him, you know, t hit hit his fungo on the final infield, the final warm up infield, and I was covering that game with UCLA. And um, 
I got a little emotional before the game. I was like, pull it together, pull it together. <laughs> but yeah. well, that's I, right. You're going on the air. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I think he has, and I hope he has, you know, had been able to soak, soak in the moments that, um, he's had so many of them, you know, 36 years and, um, appreciate them a little bit more. Yeah. And I, I just, his candor is so good. He even that he brought up that Holly Rowe asked him, can we announce it? He's like, no, I'm going to do it in my terms. Like, like Frank right. Sinatra's my way. Right. Uh, it that's so refreshing, but I think it also respect, I give, you know, it, the respect he has from everybody, like, Nobody in the media really touched it. Like, you know, he got asked about it a couple times, like after the regional against Ole Miss, he was asked about it because I guess they showed him that he was emotional after the regional. And he deflected the answer, talking about, hey, you know, it's a long year and COVID, stuff like that. But for the most part, the media kind of stayed away from it. I think out of respect for him, whereas a lot of times if it's a coach, people would be speculating more. But I think they gave him that respect. And I think that speaks volumes to him and how much respect he has, not just from his players, other coaches and things, but even the media, I think, uh, respects the heck out of them. Yeah, I think it all worked out. I was really happy with the coverage and the media um, covering him and, you know, like exactly what you're saying, not poking too much, just being very respectful of it. I think he's earned that respect. So I'm, I was very happy about that. But at the same time, I was always also very happy that, you know, in a, in a way he was able to get his flowers with the TV coverage um, I think having Jenny Dalton cover his super regional could not have been more perfect. And in the booth, I mean, in the studio, I should yeah. say, outside yeah, at the World Series, there. they did that. They did a great segment on uh, during that World Series about him, and she kind of had some good, nice words to say and, and broke down. I mean, she yeah. broke down, obviously. Yeah, so I, I was just really happy that she was able to cover him there. And then um, during the World Series, they obviously said some really nice things, which – I know he does not care about at all, but like me, I'm sitting there I'm like, no, give him his flowers. Like talk about what he's done. He deserves it. Um, even though he doesn't care. <laughs> so I, I was really happy with how the media coverage worked out. You know, it's, it's a tough situation and no matter what's going to happen, it's going to be sad, but it, I think it worked out as good as it could have. The cool thing is and now in retrospect, last fall, I want to say maybe it was last fall where like you all set up that whole thing with each decade teams and you did the zooms where each decade would hang out with him and stuff. I mean, now in retrospect, it all it just all connects now. That I don't know if you guys even had an idea about that, but that, that's a pretty special moment now in retrospect that you were part of the all 2010s and you all got together and spent time with him. Uh, they did that with all the decade teams. In retrospect, that's a that's a pretty cool moment there where all of you were together. They're one of the last turns out one of the last times. Yeah, that was one of the really special things that we were able to do um, during COVID is to have that Zoom reunion, if you will, and have all the greats from each decade and have coach there. And um, it's too bad that the conversations before the series conversations couldn't have been aired because I think our Zoom was like an hour and a half long, even though we were only our portion to talk was only like 25 minutes. Yeah. Was, but then we're just he's kept we're catching up with everyone and what are you doing and you know, somebody's getting married here. Somebody's pregnant here. You know, how are the kids? So, um, yeah, it was it was a pretty uh, good hour Zoom session in the fall with uh, all of those greats and with Coach. You're an Arizonan. What does he mean to that area in general? I mean, this is not just an Arizona story. It's a sports story. I mean, the newspapers. He told you know, you know, the Phoenix Suns are in the playoffs. That's a big story. But yet, this is a big story too over there. What is, what, what does he mean to that area in that region? Because that's a big stop. I mean. Rich Herrera, who I know very well, has covered Major League Baseball on the national level, national radio host, is covering this. You know what I mean? He's from there, obviously. I get it. And used to cover Arizona softball on the broadcast in his younger days. I've talked to him about it. But that – this was a bigger – this was a huge story. Was everybody aware of that, that not only – this was not – people outside of Arizona was really locked in on this story? You know, he means um, – oof. I mean, he may be number one – in terms of influential sports figures in the state of Arizona. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm just trying to rack my brain really quick, but I don't, I don't know if there's a bigger uh, figure in, especially the Tucson community, but the, the state as a whole, if you ask any, any player that's from the state of Arizona, they've gone to coach Candrea's camps. Right. Everyone has been to his camps, you know, whether they were in Prescott in the old days or, um, just recently, the last uh, decade, been here in Tucson. Um, like I said, the hitting tapes as well. But 
just he's he's out in the community you'll see him at football games you'll see him at baseball games um you'll see him on the golf course you know i know he's really excited to spend more time there but um he's he bounces around you know and even as busy as he was in his coaching career with recruiting and having to do his duties with um the softball team he you would just see him everywhere and so i think um, we'll continue to see him everywhere and he'll be continuing to show up to support other sports around the state yeah uh, but yeah no number one in terms of impact and just recognize people know who he is they know what he looks like if you see him on the street hey coach you know how's it going how's the team you know he's right. just, he's, a, he's the mount rushmore of all not just college but like all sports in arizona he's like on the mount rushmore oh, yeah. right oh, yeah. like Easily. i mean I mean, him and Lou Olson, who won a national title, men's basketball is up there as well. And then I'm trying to think from a pro athlete standpoint, I'll defer to you since you lived there. I don't know who, I mean, all time Arizona, Larry Fitzgerald is big deal, obviously, would probably yeah. be mentioned, right, on that list. Yeah. Randy Johnson and the Diamondbacks World Series, that tr- kind of jumps to mind for me. Kurt mm-hmm. Warner led him to a Super Bowl. But the thing is, none of those people were there for 36 seasons. Wow. Uh, I mean, he, he, he talked about in his press conference, this is his second job that he ever had. And his first was at a junior college in Arizona. So uh, Arizona man through and through. That's wild. That's wild. One of the most recognizable with a recognizable brands. I mean, people, when people, casual people think college softball, they think uh, Arizona, you know, and and he's told me the story. He's told others the story that the, 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 he came up with the idea of the Arizona with the pinstripes because he's a Yankee fan. I mean, those are recognized. People recognize those jerseys. Like, I'll share this story with. I think I've told you off the air. You know, I called the UCF Arizona game this year on ESPN Plus. That's the first time I've ever seen Arizona play in person, ever. It was the first time I ever saw him in person. You know, unfortunately with Zoom, I mean, not with the COVID protocols. I couldn't like just go down to the and say hello, like <laughs> like in a normal year. But I was. I remember when that schedule came out. I texted my coach, uh, Cindy Ball Malone, and I said, "Thank, wow, like you got Arizona to come here, you know, and that's one of my highlights of 14 years. And it now, and especially now that it turns out it was his last year, it just blows my mind. I was like, wow, thank God I, you know, I watched him before he retired and watch Arizona. Just seeing those jerseys in person, it's like seeing the Yankees, right? When you go to a major league ballpark, it's kind of like you have to do it if you're a softball fan at some point. Uh, if you don't go to Hildebrand to do it, at least try to do it somewhere. No, I've, I've had um, friends or teammates that are on other teams and I won't blast them publicly, but we always do get the best rep for best uniforms and um, the most recognizable uniforms, you know, I, I think the most legendary uniforms. And he was the first one to introduce pants in our game. It was all about the shorts and um, Arizona came out, they were wearing pants and that script Arizona across the chest. And you're exactly right. Those uniforms you know, tried and true, even till today. So as Coach Lowe quoting her, pity the fool that has to follow uh, yeah. Coach Contreras. Well, it turns out it's her. That was a good liner by her. Oh, that was a great line. Uh, so Caitlin Lowe named head coach to follow. Not a surprise. Well-deserved. Your thoughts on her. Why is she the right person to fill maybe one of the biggest shoes in the history of this sport, of all sports, really? Yeah, she... I mean, everyone knows who Caitlin Lowe is because what she's done on the field. And, um, but if you ask anyone, she's not the most vocal person. So I don't feel like a lot of people know a lot about her, but I'll just tell you, she's a total rock star. I mean, she's solid. She knows who she is. She knows what she wants. Uh, I think we got a glimpse of that in the press conference. I thought she, you know, hit it out of the park. Not that, you know, a press conference matters or dictates how you are as a head coach, but it's the first impression and her first impression was um, as good as we all expected it to be. And uh, the fact that she's been under his tutelage the last couple of years. And, you know, I think they won't ever tell us, but I think they were kind of getting her ready for that um, just because of who she is and, and what kind of player she was and the fact that she wanted to come back and be a coach, but she's a total rock star. I mean, I, I feel good about it as an alum. She's, she's going to be great. How important was it to keep it in the family? We see this in college basketball. Mike Krzyzewski, Duke men's basketball, is going to have his last year. His assistant's going to take over, Shire, who played for him. North Carolina, Roy Williams retires. Hubert Davis, they keep it in the family. That, how big and important was that? And Was that a big deal to, hey, look, whenever that day comes, it's got to be an alum? Do you, I mean, did you feel that way? 
or well, did, did the alum feel that way? Yeah, and I'm not one, I've said this before, but I'm not one that says that you, you need to be an alum of your school to be an effective coach. Mm -hmm. I don't even think you have to be that great of a player to be an effective coach. You just need to be a good coach. Um, but those situations that you're talking about are so rare and they're so different than, um, I mean, we'll never see this again. We will never see a 36 year career with eight national championships at one school. Um, I mean, I know he's not the only coach, but it feels like it, right. The last coach was in the eighties. So, you know, so <laughs> I think it's very important. I think it's very important that, um, it is his program, you know, which makes it her program. You know, it's the family's program. It's Arizona's program. And he is the family. He is Arizona. You know, he's the top of the tree. So I think it was very important for him and for all of us uh, and for her. And important, too, that she's been in the program, so she knows how everything works. And the fans obviously adore her, appreciate it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like there won't be that pressure that sometimes there is when you follow a legend, like, oh, you're, they're being compared to legend. I think everybody understands she's, and she said this in the press conference. She's, she's, you know, she's not Mike Andrea. She's Caitlin Lowe. I think right. that's important. And I think that's important that everybody kind of understands that she's going to do it her way. And I think having Taryn as her pitching coach, I think it's a great one, two punch. Uh, I think really the only thing that matters is that she has his blessing, you know, yes. and clearly that he that you know he gave her her blessing he was he's so excited for her to take over she was his choice he wanted her from the get-go and really that should be the only thing that matters to the fans like it came from him you know what i mean i know i know you have to you have to get hired and you have to but for him he feels good about it and uh, she has his blessing and like i said she's been part of this staff that's built this kind of run here they're starting here with this great classes they've had here as well so uh that's the other thing is the cover's not bare, <laughs> no pun intended, oh. right? I mean, yes, they lose a great senior class, but I was impressed with some of the youngsters there, Mionio and Scoopin and company. Like, what's, I mean, what is she, what, you know, the, 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 the this is a team that's going to be pretty good again. Were your thoughts on kind of what she inherits? I mean, well, technically she's already there, obviously, but uh, he left, he's left her in a good spot. It's not like other places where you're kind of starting from scratch. No, there's a really solid nucleus to build around Mionio. Uh, Pac-12 freshman of the year, Pac-12 batting champion as a yeah. freshman. Um, Charlize Palacios probably taking over behind uh, home plate. She was phenomenal. I thought she could have been an All-American this year. I think the fact that she was mostly the designated hitter kind of hurt her in that aspect, but an All-American caliber kid will be behind the plate. Um, yeah, Scoopin, a big presence um, in, at first base. And Hannah Bowen, uh, who was their best pitcher you know, returns for her senior season. So definitely some pieces that, you know, they'll need for their freshmen coming in and maybe even hitting the transfer portal for a pitcher possibly. But yeah, you want to start a build a program around a young group Well, they have a really good young group to build around. It's going to be interesting for fans because it's going to be looking a lot different, right? You don't have the legend at third base anymore. You don't have those seven super seniors out on the field you think about five position spots so it's going to look very different but the caliber is there yeah talent's still there and they got another strong class coming in as well uh as well now you look at the pac-12 perspective you got caitlin low chelsea spencer at cal jessica allister at stanford i mean we're starting you know six of nine head coaches are alums there and the majority of them are young too it's like uh, I know Amy Hogue's been there a while at Utah. Uh, you know, obviously Kelly Inoue Perez at UCLA. But what does that mean? What is it when I say six out of nine? I mean, there's a, there's a sense of pride there I got from when people have been mentioning that with Caitlin being added. All nine head coaches, female as well. That was been brought up as well. When you what what jumps to your mind with now with the head coaching kind of look here in the Pac-12? Yeah, it's so interesting because we were just talking about this the other day. I think. Um, well, it was back when Spencer got hired and then Lombardi before her, but we were talking about these coaching jobs rarely come up in the Pac-12 conference. I mean, the Pac-12, we only have nine, nine mighty schools over here on the West Coast, um, but the, the head coaching jobs just don't come around. So the fact that we've had three in the last three years and all relatively at the beginning of their head coaching career and their endeavors, and I think it's a really exciting time. And um I think there's a lot to build around in terms of the alum and 
um, all women, very cool aspects. Um, not to tell coach, Hey, we're waiting for you to leave, but <laughs> he, he, he gets it. He understands. I mean, he's been around women his entire life. He's, you know, the best female, um, supporter, you know, in our, our sports ever. Seen. Sure. So, um, but it's, it's just very cool. It's a very cool thing to, to build some excitement around for sure. I do wonder, like, because he's been one of the spokesmen, if you will, for the league, right? Like, everybody listens. Kelly's that way, too. So is it is it now Kelly and Yue Perez and Heather Tarr, maybe, like, quote, unquote, the faces of the Pac-12 from a head coaching standpoint that, hey, I need I need a reaction from somebody in the Pac-12. That's the go-to now. Is that is that accurate? I would, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, those are two coaches that have national titles. I mean, I, I think when you, when you have a national title as a coach, it gives you – you know, a pedestal, um, to, to speak. And when you speak, it carries extra weight. So I think you're right on with that. Um, and, uh, you know, I always love to hear what Heather Tarr and, um, coach anyway, Perez have to say, they always drop nuggets and coach Candrea was that way for me. It's just one of those interviews when you hear them in an interview, you kind of stop and listen and you want to, you know, hear what they have to say. So I think you're, I think you're right on with that. What's his lasting legacy for Pac-12 softball, we've talked about Arizona softball, but what's his lasting legacy for Pac-12 softball? When we talk about Pac-12 softball and the and, and the dominance, like he has to come up at the top of the list, right? The history of Pac-12 softball. I mean, that's where when you say the Golden Day, the Pac-12 is the premier softball conference. It started with it starts with him in some ways, along UCLA as well, obviously. But unlike UCLA, they've had different coaches. He's been the constant. Yeah. You know, there's, there's multiple things. And even outside the Pac-12 conference, um, I think facilities, he was the first one to really put and drive importance on, Hey, we need a stadium back in 1992, 91. Like we, we need a facility for this, for this team. And it's kind of the theme that you've seen this year in the women's college world series. Like if you build it, they will come. Well, that was coach Candrea back in the early nineties. And if you think about, that was the only program that had fans in droves. Like people were standing room only back in the early nineties. And that was a really big deal for our sport. Um, And someone had to do it. He was gutsy enough to say, you know, we'll back it up. You build it, I'll fill it, you know? So I think that was, to me, I think that was legacy number one is the facility and, and getting it going and making this sport big time. Like he thought it was. Right. Like does, does Hildebrand even exist without him or to the, to the extent where it is now? Cause I had him on when the, the renovations were beginning and he said that was very important. And he pushed for that hard when quite frankly, it wasn't the it thing to do, right? Like it was, you know, it, 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 you know, up until recently, you know, if somebody tried to say, Hey, we need renovations at softball, the administrations may look the other way and stuff like that. Most of the time, not like now where everybody's kind of like more aware of it. He was at your mention. He was at the forefront is Hildebrand around without them no absolutely not i mean you have to have donors right to build it but you also have someone to push it and someone to say hey look what we could build um he talks about the story of him drawing it on a napkin after their first world series and um showing it he was on the airplane back from the world series and i think it was 1990 and drew it on a napkin on the airplane and showed one of the donors and said you know this is what i'm thinking this is what i want this is what i'm dreaming of and um the Bill Hillenbrand was uh, gracious enough to say, yeah, let's do it. Let's build it. Why not? Let's make a stadium for women, you know, unprecedented. So, and then of course, I'm just so happy he was able to get um, this second facelift of Rita Hillenbrand. Uh, same thing. He had the plan. I, I remember him talking about on my recruiting, on my recruiting trips. I remember him talking about wanting to build, you know, the, the shade for the stadium and build a concourse and, Unfortunately, you know, those things take resources and time. And he was very patient, a lot more patient than I think he <laughs> should have been. But um, ultimately, it got done. And that's all that matters. Um, and the fact that he was able to coach in the last three years was really special for all of us. My guess is they're, we're not done honoring him, right? I mean, I would just say without like going, you know, there, there's this, there'll be things done for him here. Maybe next season, he'll probably be honored in some way, things like that. Uh, I would imagine uh, that first game in Hildebrand will probably be a little emotional. I would assume he'll be honored in some capacity, and it'll be unique to see that dugout without him there. It'll be unique for everybody. It'll be kind of odd, but at the same time, I think it'll be 
it'll be a unique experience, surreal experience, but I, I, I would think they're going to honor him in very good ways. And his presence will be around. You mentioned he's going to be in a suite. He's got a suite. Well, yeah, they have the suites now at Hillenbrand. If you look up above the first base side, there's a nice little suite up there. Indoors, AC. Can, he yell, at, can he yell at umps from there? Um, windows do open. So okay. Yes. Yes. I feel like that need, you know, he needs to let, he still needs to let that go a little bit. Like, go ahead and yell at the ump once in a while for old times. Oh sake. Can you imagine having him behind home plate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, oh my goodness. Well, we could see too many, so many stories about it, but. Uh, well, I will say my, yeah. my, my hopes are, I mean, I know we're already, as alums, we're already planning some like big alum get togethers because we weren't able to have sure. everyone there, you know, this week or last week, if you will. But um, I, I really want there to be like a statue in. in all right. You brought it up. See, I wasn't going to bring it up because I, no, I didn't want to get yeah. in trouble. I, mean, I, I didn't get, all right, go ahead. And. I want it to be his, like, this is my bucket list, but I want it to be, like, his coaching um, with his hand out for a high five. You know, that that just uh, iconic pose when, you know, Jesse Harper's rounding third and he yeah. reaches out for a high five. So that way fans can give him a high five, you know, something like that. That's, pretty, now what, that, that's a good point, because explain this, because Arizona is one of the few schools you honor your past, like, really good. Like, it's, describe how – every because I – when I watch Hildebrand, I see a lot of numbers, right? Like in the outfield that just describe what, what does it, how does Arizona honor their players and maybe something that we could apply to coach here? What, how do they honor their players? Well, when you walk in, especially now that it's redone, it was like this before, but it's a lot prettier now. But when you walk in, you see, I think there's now 105 or 108 all American citations for um, Arizona. So you walk in and you see all those names and you see the players of the year and, and their graphics and, um, all of those Pac-12 awards. Yeah. So, so I would just love to add, you know, a, you know, a graphic of him, and you know, I you see Jenny fair. Finch and you see Nancy Evans and Susie Para. So, and Jenny Dalton, and I would love for there to be a room for him with all his accolades, so people can like a Hall of Fame, if you will. And um, there's also a little street right outside Helen Brand. I don't know. This is way above what I know, but I'm like, could we rename that street? It's Why not? Right outside. Yeah, you know, you see it at like Yankee Stadium and stuff, so that would be really cool. Um, I would be happy with either, any of the any of those things. Now the players where they're honored, you said the graphics. Where is that set up in the stadium? Right when you walk in, so front gates, okay. um, ticket, walk in. It's right there. You see it. Um, do they really retire good. numbers? They do. They've retired numbers only if you were a player of the year. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, that, so those are the numbers we see on TV when they. Yeah, so there's four, four yeah. numbers. And then the fifth is um, Julie Ray Tan, who passed away in the 90s. Um, they honored her and retired her number as well. Could there so be a, there. right. Is there, a, now, is there a number we could use for Mike to uh, have a, like a. 36? Oh. I don't know. There you go. See? Or yeah, eight? Or eight? I don't know if eight's yeah, taken. Eight. Well, eight. Uh, oh, I need to do, let me Google this. But I think eight is Mickey Mantle. No, Mickey Mano was seven. Oh, he was? Okay. He was Who seven. was number eight? Somebody Yogi Berra. Eight. Yogi Berra was eight. I know he's, I'm oh, just going okay. Yankees there. If you're going Yankee references. Yeah, no, I, I it has to be Yankee references because I remember Deja Mooley Pola changed her number to eight because of a famous Yankee player. So it must have been Yogi Berra. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know. All right, we'll, of- we'll figure out. We got time here to figure this out. We can't, yeah. you know, we got, we got to do that for him and then we'll name the broadcast booth after you. Right, that's not oh, what this okay. makes. Well, I don't know. I got to share it with Jenny. I got to share it with Leah. There's a lot of us out got, there. Yeah, I was gonna say, man, you guys are like you're broadcast you over there. Like, we are broadcast you. We should take they? that title and run with it. I like it. For softball, I don't. I don't see who would be your competition. I'm trying to think. UCLA, of course, it would have to Probably be UCLA. Yeah. Um, Natasha and Amanda. Yeah. A and M is trying yeah, to make know, a push. I know, like a lot, I know there's a lot of that used a lot of players on both sides that used to broadcast and then went back to coaching. So, but um, yeah, I'll share it with Jenny and Leah for sure. Okay, well, we got a deal. All right, well, this was fun to catch up and tell some coach uh, stories there, Kenzie. I appreciate you uh, taking the time, Kenzie Fowler here on In the Circle as we honor Coach Kendrea. We could do this for hours, but oh, yeah. he, he would no, probably get I've, he'd get mad. He would get mad probably. Oh yeah, I could talk about Coach for. For forever, <laughs> I lose my voice. <laughs> uh, obviously, very well, very well. But uh, you did a great job here. Thank you for sh- uh, sharing your observations on him, on a, on a legend, and obviously the program at Arizona. This monumental story in softball. 
Uh, always appreciate having you on, and uh, we'll definitely have you on uh, down the road, and we'll figure out the stat. If you need help, any counseling, you know, as far as I, you know, I could I could contribute as far as ideas. I'm very. This big. postseason was emotional, man. I got, I need some weeks to recover. I need to like you and sleep me both. Yeah, you oh, and me both. Gosh, <laughs> we, need to, we all deserve some softball time off because our hearts were put through it. You have you have that fortune. I may not. Uh, there's okay, always okay. stuff going on, especially the Olympics yeah. around the corner too. So there won't be oh, much. That's sleep. right. Yeah, we got athletes eliminated in the Olympics, so that'll be yeah. good. It'll be that'll good. Be good for us. <laughs> it'll be good. It'll be good. All right, Kenzie. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me.